Okay, I see him from my little indicator that supposedly we're recording now, so here we are. Hey, welcome everybody again to another one of my webinar interviews. And uh, as once again, I've got a fantastic uh, couple of guests today. The guest of honor is Dr. Angela Franks uh, from, uh, uh, from God, I'm drawing a uh, St. John Seminary in Boston. You're still at St. John Seminary in Boston, are you not? Yeah, that's right. Angela Frank and uh, Dr. Rodney Hauser, my old colleague from DeSales University. So I'm going to have Angela, Dr. Angela, uh, introduce herself here briefly. In, but first, we're going to start with, uh, with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, seed of wisdom, pray for us. From the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let's uh, turn it right on over. Dr. Angela Frank, could you please tell the viewers who you are? And uh, please, I, I always like to go beyond the, the mere academic credentials. Um, where are you originally from? Where did you get your doctorate? You know, how many kids do you have? All that kind of stuff. If you're willing to share all of that bio information with us, go ahead. Okay, I wasn't prepared for that, but I'll I'll do my best. Some of this is top secret, so you have an exclusive here. <laughs> it's um, a scoop. It's a scoop. So a little known fact of, about me is that I was born in West Virginia. And people say, oh, I have a cousin in Charlottesville, and that is the wrong state. Um, I'm from West Virginia, and you're not allowed to make an incest joke to my face until we've known each other for at least 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> my rule, I had to establish that in high school. That would never have crossed my mind. <laughs> it crosses a lot of people's minds, astonishingly. Yeah, I'm um, from Nebraska. I'm sure there's a lot of inbreeding out there, so I'm not one to talk. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, and Rodney's from, you know, Southwestern PA. We all know what oh, goes on okay. in, so in Pencil, Pens, Pencil, Tucky. Yeah. And just quickly, I'm 35 north, not miles north of what in West Virginia? Something spring. I don't know. I'm very close to West Virginia. Berkeley Springs or something. Yeah. There you go. Something very like nice. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very yeah. good. Okay. So we have rudely interrupted your your narrative. So go ahead. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, that's that's about all I'm going to say about West Virginia. But I um, I have a master's degree in philosophy and a doctorate in theology. And right now I'm doing a lot on um, John Paul II and the body, but also Hansers von Balthasar, who's one of my, um, that was my, the subject of my dissertation. Um, yes, the cheering. Let me interrupt you. You did, your, you did your dissertation under the, under the late great Father Lamb, correct, Nat Lamb? He was one of my readers. And oh, also just, the other okay. reader was the late great Father Edward Oakes. So that was quite the pair. Yeah. And but Father he, Father Oakes was my dissertation director. So we have that whoa. in common. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 So that was that was lovely. Um the um the director of my dissertation is um Father Robert and Belly. Oh, no wonder why you know him. I we, we had him on the show. Well, you know that. Yes, uh, about I a do. month ago. Yeah. I love Father Imbelli. If you're listening, uh, thanks a lot for your interview. We'll have to have you on again. So once again, I have interrupted the flow of your narrative. So go That's ahead. That's okay. Um, just I would just add maybe that I'm um, really interested in metaphysics. It seems like everything I'm doing right now comes back to metaphysics because so much of I'm, I'm interested in the contemporary mission field of the developed world. So what's all around us? I'm right now based in Boston. And so it's very much the, you know, the mission field of the new evangelization. So trying to make sense of that. And it usually seems to involve metaphysical errors as well as theological um, challenges. And so that's really where I'm doing a lot of my work right now. And that's well, it. That, and, that's fa and, and you're still, at, yeah, I interrupted you a lot. So you're you're still up in Boston at the seminary. Okay, that's great. So let's get right into it. One of the things that we're very interested in, you mentioned that your your scholarship uh, lately has trended towards some theology of, of the body kind of stuff. Uh, you have uh, something that is, what really caught my attention was something that Rodney Hauser, Dr. Hauser brought to my attention today. I have been reading some of your articles in Church Life Journal on gender and uh, the current controversies over, over gender and transgenderism. But then uh, I, you know, I subscribed to Comunio, uh, but I had not read your article in here, uh, which is on fluidity and modernity uh, and sort of liquid personhood today. And I highly recommend it's you can. Rodney, didn't you say it's on PDF electronic version at the Comunio website? That's right. Yes. 
So the viewers don't have to necessarily subscribe to Comunio to uh, read the article. And so you can get you can download the PDF. And I highly recommend that you do it. It's really a brilliant article. So let's uh, let's uh, let's begin. And then, Rodney, and I'm going to turn turn it over to you. So just be prepared. Start formulating a question in that in that bean of yours there. Uh, I, I'm I was really struck at the beginning of the article by that you were hitting some themes that I know Rod Dreher and his blog has hit with regard to the po Polish sociologist. Oh, I can't think of his last name now. Zygmunt uh, Bauman. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he talks about, in a sense, the liquid liquidity and liquid modernity and, and liquid persons in modernity. Could you, so in other words, Vatican II, as you say at the beginning of this article, you know, notoriously, <laughs> infamously asked us to read the signs of the times that was kind of misunderstood but you are very adept in this article of doing just that you begin it by doing an analysis of what ails us really in 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 this modern gender mania that we're going through and you link it to his analysis of our liquid personhood so maybe you could unpack that just a little bit sure yeah thank you so i i find bauman's um, assessment of modernity to be very persuasive that he says that that originally in modernity so going back to early modernity you know 1600s and so forth that modernity was very solid and by that he means there's a lot of institutions there's still very much a class structure family was still in descendants was still that all that was still very important um but there's this drive within modernity to liquefy that sort of thing. And it's really, Bauman doesn't get into the history of it so much, but if you look more at the, the history of ideas, that, that drive is really this drive for, for radical equality. And so the idea is that if we have these solid social structures that hem us in and limit our choices, that um, to be truly free, we have to liquidate those social structures. And really there's something even though I, I disagree with that knee-jerk drive toward liquidization, there is something Christian in that impulse, in that, as I try to talk a little bit in this article, um, Christ does ask us to relativize things like family and social structures and employment and, and all that sort of thing, that those are not supposed to be the things that we get our ultimate identity from. They're not supposed to be really what defines us, but rather our as I argue from a Balthazarian perspective, it's our mission from Christ that defines us. And so while these social structures are basically natural and therefore good insofar as they're natural, they are also not the ultimate thing, but rather the penultimate thing, you could say. And so um, so there's like good and bad in this drive to liquidate. And and the where we are today, of course, is that um, the things that seem to be the most solid are the things coming under the most attack. It's kind of like a, a pressure washer or something. And and really, yeah. the things that we have left that are solid, are the ones that I can think of are really twofold. It's the church, the Catholic church in particular. And so that gets a lot of draws a lot of um, fire. Um, but then second, the things centered around the family, the body, you know, so the things centered around sexuality, but also, in fact, our very bodies, right? That seems very solid. The binary, the, the dreaded gender binary is, is very solid and fixed. And so there's this yearning for people to liquidate that. And so it's, I, I try to be clear on the the negative aspects of all of this liquidization and Bauman is very clear on that um, but I also try to say all right but what's the good that is being desired even if it's being desired very badly and very confusedly and with all sorts of errors so I'm not at all trying to say that you know we should just embrace all the chaos around us but but I think it's it's effective to not only single out what's bad which we have to do but also, even better to try to figure out the good that's being misunderstood and then offer up the, the real good so that, that we can channel people's desire. Like what are they truly trying to desire? And so then that's what I try to unpack in the rest of that article. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Rodney, do you want to chime in here? before? Because I have some follow-up questions too to what she just said. Tons of ideas were race, racing through my head. But before I run off with those, I want to turn it over to you so you get your two cents in here. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, me too. I mean, that just it stimulates all sorts of thoughts. And it seems that 
one of the things I think you're you're getting at, maybe not intentionally or whatever, is is that there can be a sort of bourgeois worship of the family that's sort of just as dreadful or just as problematic as a bourgeois worship of I want to do what I want with my body or or whatever, right? So so there's there's a kind of um, in both cases there's there's the kind of um, inordinate obsession with this worldly finite uh, sort of well-being, if you will, right? So so if you say that uh, you know you you have to have this kind of normal family and you have to have these sort of normal inclinations you have to be a proper woman and a proper ma masculine man and a feminine woman and and the whole nine yard we have all the kind of bougie stereotypes that sort of surround that i can kind of see a backlash against that where some people are like but well, this is all bull crap i don't fit into these 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 categories at all but then what kind of tends to happen however is that it also be becomes sort of um fixated on the self and its desires and what makes it most immediately happy and and and, and sort of temporal well-being and chap you've written about this in in some of your blogs this this bourgeois christianity that's sort of dominated for you know god yeah. knows how long and yeah. and it seems to me that angelo one of the things you're getting at is that what we need is a kind of radical call to something also horizontal right i mean i'm sorry uh, 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 also vertical that that sort of disrupts in some ways the maybe 50s family on the one hand and the and the 2000s uh pick your you know letter sort of thing on the on the other i, I mean is am i on to something or is that totally off the wall it's just... no i i think that's right because i mean the the 50s family has going for it that the family is a natural reality and a lot of you know the the crazy stuff is wants nothing to do with nature but if right. you think about you know to to maybe take it out of our context if you think about when christ came you know you you had a very solid family structure say in roman society Right. Where you've got the paterfamilias and you have then under him the wife and the children. And um, and it's not like the family, like like every social, um, every cultural environment is going to have distortions of natural reality. So, you know, we the 1950s family has distortions. The Roman family has distortions. Right? It's not like there was after actual paradise. There was no like paradise of, of where the culture gets it all right. But um, but you can see how Christianity was very um, disruptive to that Roman solidity of, you know, this is how it is. And the important thing is to align our will with the father of the family. And Christianity comes and says, actually, the important thing is to align your will with God. Mm -hmm. And so it's always served to destabilize um, the, the idols that we make of sometimes good natural realities, but but when it's purely, as you say, just horizontal, if the, the horizontal realities become our ultimate good, then it's an idol and it's not going to make us happy the way we want it to. And so, yeah, I think it's important to realize that that there's always that tendency to making idols. Yeah. Oh, that that's that's kind of what I, Rodney sort of asked one of the questions that was uh, popping around in my head as well, you know, thinking about some of the stereotypical sort of very, very solid gender roles that perdured in, in, in American families, uh, you know, well up until, you know, modern times. And that in many ways, these were not, in many ways, they were expressive of natural realities, but also in many ways, they were exaggerations and, and, and distortions and, 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 and really held, held people in check, especially women in many ways were, were held back from full social responsibility and, and dynamic engagement because of, of gender roles. I also think there was a certain, uh, not to get too far off topic, but remembering I'm 63 years old, remembering when I grew up, uh, the, 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 with regard to the stereotypes of masculine and feminine, I, I just remember at, when I was growing up in the 60s that if a young girl, you know, who was 9, 10, 11 years old, liked uh, boy things like playing baseball and wearing jeans and running around with the guys, you know, outside playing football and stuff, she was called a tomboy. And that was not necessarily a pejorative term. Uh, well, oh, yeah, she she likes sports. She's a tomboy. 
uh, and she'll grow out of it eventually. And there were no real negative connotations with regard to that. But a boy who broke out of certain stereotypes of masculinity, who was effeminate, did not enjoy any such favors. To be an effeminate boy back then uh, was 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 the kind of the kiss of death socially in in many 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 ways. Um, so in in some ways. That I, I guess what I'm sort of rambling at here is that there some of these stereotypes really were were harmful, and that I think therefore your article was spot on in in saying well, well let's not just scorched earth reject some of these uh, some of these inner dynamic movements towards a greater fluidity in our understanding of things. Let's not just reject them to court. Let's take a look at them and see how they can be corrected. So I'm I'm going to say I mean. I'm, with, I, I'd really like to hear your opinion of what I was talking about with regard to those stereotypes. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that, actually. So I'll try to be brief. But um, oh, no, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm very um, concerned <laughs> with gender stereotypes, or we could say sex stereotypes, if we're talking about male and female here. Um, the problem with sex stereotypes is that um, they're never... Uh, accurate when it comes to the range of human personalities that fall under the categories of male and female. I, I used to feel this a little bit. Um, my, my first two kids are um, first a girl and then a boy. And we would occasionally get the, well, you must be done now because you have, you know, your girl and your boy. And I used <laughs> to think as though the entire variety of humanity can be encapsulated under the categories girl and boy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have six kids and they're all extremely different. And some of those differences are sex based and some of them are just really more personality based. And so, um, Sex stereotypes, as you say, can be like actually harmful. And, you know, we have a lot of historical study on this. These days we fall into this perverse kind of progressive sex stereotyping when instead of the girl being a tomboy these days in the in the wrong school environment she'll be told oh no actually that must mean inside you're a boy <laughs> you really are just, a boy yeah. you really are a boy and so like <laughs> so now it's like this return to these really limiting and not very thoughtful sex stereotypes and so i'm really opposed to, to the the thing about sex. So there's a, a distinction that was made in the 20th century that a lot of people disagree with because it's really been run with in a bad direction. But I think there's something to be said for this basic distinction between sex as a biological reality, maleness and femaleness, which has to do fundamentally with your body and how it's ordered to one of the two basic ways in which humans reproduce, in which humans generate. And so maleness and femaleness as sex is really about do I reproduce as a man or do I reproduce as a woman? And that's that's really where, where that difference is rooted, right? It's rooted at right, that right. level of generation. And then you can talk about gender, which is now a very loaded term. And so some people don't like to use it, but um, gender can be understood as the social and cultural accretions that build up around the sexes. And a lot of feminists use this term basically in a way to say down with cultural accretions and we'll make our own. And, and you know, you can understand why, because they were concerned about these stereotypes and so forth. The thing is, though, that that every culture builds up some kind of gendered norms around maleness and femaleness. Like the, it's just it's utopian to think that we're going to live without those because we just don't. Um, but so the question is more not do we have cultural gendered norms? Because, of course, every culture does. The question is, are they good norms? Right. And, right, and so you right. can see. And, and the fact that these norms are arbitrary often. So, for example, in Scotland, men can wear skirts, I guess. And in America, they really shouldn't. And so like that's <laughs> that's arbitrary in the sense, you know, like Jesus. what a shame that is. Yeah, well, you know, Larry, <laughs> move to Scotland. <laughs> but, you know, so like that, so people point to that kind of thing and it's like, oh, that's arbitrary. And it's like, well, yes, of course it's arbitrary. But that doesn't mean that society doesn't, a society needs those norms, even if they're somewhat arbitrary. And especially getting to your point of the effeminate boy, 
We especially need cultural norms around men and around boys because yes. girls grow into their femininity in the sense of becoming accustomed to it if the culture doesn't fight it the way our culture is. But but if the culture is saner and healthier, it's it's fairly um, easy for a girl to grow into an embrace of her femininity because, you know, she gets her period like she, you know, like there's just everything signaling to her what her body is ordered toward. But for men, there's this there's a natural disconnect between them and what happens in generation, which is what masculinity is ultimately rooted in. And so for men, it's a lot harder to develop that understanding of who they are as men. And so we have a lot more cultural norms around men than we do around women. This is Walter Ong, by the way. This I didn't come up with this. This is Father Walter Ong. Um, it doesn't mean that the norms are always good. And so, you know, the example of the, the you know, the effeminate boy getting bullied. And so we're like, you know, obviously oh, yeah. the, the norms can can get stifling and can be oppressive, but that doesn't mean that we don't need them. We do need, it's just like, it's kind of like traffic laws are arbitrary. Yes. Like, why do yes. we stop at red? I mean, that's arbitrary, but like we need something, right? But and you so got it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, for example, in my own case, and I'll turn it back over to Rodney. I mean, I grew up with a, a uh, man who was my father, who I love. He's still alive, thankfully. Uh, he was a Korean War veteran, but he was a child of that post-war era. And he evinced all of the male sort of virtues that our society held up that a man should be. And so he was very stoic, never cried, uh, rarely showed his emotions, was very, very uh, not quick at all to show affection to his children, retained a certain fatherly detachment. The, my mother was the nurturer, the emotional one, the one you would cry on her shoulder when you had boo-boos and stuff. My dad was very loving and he brought home the bacon and, you know, he fixed plumbing and <clears throat> stuff like that, did carpentry. So that's the image of maleness that I grew up with and tried to grow into and realize that in some ways, you know, I wasn't an effeminate young guy, but I, I wasn't a, a plumber, carpenter, let's go fix the roof kind of guy either. Uh, and so I struggled with that. And yet I'm glad that that model sort of kind of stifling that it was. I'm glad that model was there. I'm glad that my father was who he was, this very stoic, very sort of strong, independent dude. Um, and so, I, yeah, I agree with you completely. The, none of these norms necessarily measure up completely, uh, but but they certainly, in other words, there's got to be some formal structure there. You just don't want to pour the cement all over the, all over the floor because it'll form into nothing. But anyway, Rodney, do you, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, no, this is this is very helpful and, and really interesting. Um, I, I was kind of sensing a little bit of Judith Butler in the background of, of what you were saying, Angela. And it does seem that there's this sort of postmodern Heideggerian thing that kind of wants to do, uh, you know, because all representations are not the thing in itself, therefore sort of to hell with them you know, and this is almost Nietzsche and like, make up your own then, you know, since, since we don't have access to, to, to big T truth or big N nature uh, without interpreting it in some way through some cultural lens, cultural linguistic lens, then therefore we can sort of go wherever we want, but that doesn't seem to follow. I mean, we can acknowledge that there is a gap between our articulation of the true and the good and the beautiful and and the actual true good and the beautiful but that but that's a whole other thing than saying nature bears no bearing at all on, on or, or to put it in the categories we're talking about sex has nothing to do with gender at all that is a leap you know what i mean and, and yeah. so i i think that that what you're getting at is really important because i i do think that sometimes a sort of conservative christian or conservative catholic just wants to kind of double down on on sex as if there's no gap at all right so then that can get to be problematic um but but you're right the other extreme has been um i'm a tomboy therefore i'm a boy therefore i should take puberty blocking drugs therefore i should i mean very aggressive yeah. uh really really uh problematic sorts of things that i mean you you almost fear that i mean 
this poor girl who's decided to go down this drastic path of now claiming her boyhood, so to speak, with all of these very artificial and violent interference with her body is going to someday, you know, say, oh, my gosh, I was just going through a phase or I was just a tomboy or whatever. it's almost in a way somewhat better that it, when Larry was talking about just calling them Tom, both my sisters were tomboys. Also, they played football with us in a little bit. Neither one of them would have thought that that meant, therefore, that they were a, they were a boy. And so they didn't want to be you. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They were running away from that. I probably scared them out of any of <laughs> gender identity <laughs> or whatever. But, uh, hey, Kat, by the way, you are frozen on the screen right now in this, oh. at, for at least to me. Is he frozen Not to you? Me. Oh, nope. okay. You're frozen for me, but it's it's good. You have like this very profound look on your face. You almost look like you're intelligent. <laughs> well, take a screenshot of it, and then maybe I'll use that as the profile for this. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else is moving, but you're inanimate. Yeah, well, that's uh, just you. You're you know your internet stinks. I think. But thank anyway. you. I yeah. Yeah. But no. But yeah. That that that. But anyway, I, I, um, go ahead, Rodney. Finish up. Go ahead. No, that was it. I mean, I mean, there is a kind of. There's, there's an insight, and I think this is why we can sort of learn from some of the postmodern gender stuff, because we don't want to get locked into a totally um, facile equation of sex and gender and, and all those things. But then, but you pointed out absolutely correctly that without any guidance at all, or with a total free-for-all, it really wreaks havoc on young people. And right now, and maybe you could comment on this, it really seems to be wreaking havoc on havoc on young women. Um, I've read that in the 80s, most people claiming to be the opposite sex were older men claiming to be women. But now it, the majority is uh, prepubescent, just pubescent girls claiming to be guys. I mean, do you have any thoughts about that or? Yeah, it, it definitely has. There has been this reversal. And you're, you're right that traditionally it was much more like adult men who were would be transsexuals as we used to call them and now it is there's there's so there's something called rapid onset gender dysphoria rapid onset meaning that you have an usually adolescent girl or maybe just prepubescent who is has never manifested never presented with any symptoms of gender dysphoria and then all of a sudden she starts to say oh but actually I think I'm a boy. Oh, but actually, I think I'm gender fluid. And um, the the similarities to other kinds of mimetic behavior. So, for example, eating disorders, or more tragically, even suicide. Right? Yeah. You see, you see a lot of cases where there's this this imi imitation of somebody else in a crisis, or somebody else who's doing something that seems somehow glamorous or interesting, and you'll get whole peer groups, especially of girls, who do that. And so there was this interview that a Planned Parenthood director or or employee gave with Abigail Schreer, who's written a really good book on this called Irreversible Damage. Um, and this this former Planned Parenthood person who left because she's so disturbed by a lot of things of Planned Parenthood. But one of the things she talked about, Planned Parenthood will distribute um, some of this, the opposite sex hormones and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, she talked about these groups of giggly girls coming in and signing up for their hormones. And she said it was like they're going to get their ears pierced. And, cool. and you know, there's a reason why we don't give minors, we don't say that minors have informed consent, that they have to have parents involved to give consent for medical procedures, because in part, especially for adolescents, we know that there is this inability to think long term and an inability to process things like possible side effects. And but compounded with the fact that these clinics do not give them really adequate information about possible side effects, about people detransitioning and, you know, desisting from, from transition, um, about things like the fact that they'll probably never experience sexual pleasure. They'll probably, you know, have to be like battling these, for people who go through surgery, they're literally, most of them, like, especially the more complicated surgeries, it's, it's a wound that their body is battling for their entire life. Their body is trying to heal this wound and the technology is not letting it. And so like the, the discomfort and 
you know, all of that is just not um, really included in any adequate way in the informed consent material because there's it's really ideologically driven. It's a matter of of medicine really functioning as ideology, where like people people are encouraging kids to do this, and so um, yeah, it's really I think there's something really similar. This is something Abigail Favalli has talked about too. There's there's a real similarity to adolescent eating disorders and what used to be say in the 80s and 90s where, you know, girls revolted against their bodies and the changes happening in their body and their discomfort with their body by basically just trying to obliterate their body um, or control it, like micromanage it. Now they deal with that by trying to become a different body, like have you know, the opposite sex's body. So um, I think there's a lot in that comparison. <clears throat> I think that's uh, that's all what you just said is, I think, so really important because I, I, I don't want the viewers to get the impression that as we go along and say, hey, look, the the modern sort of thoughts on gender fluidity, they have some point here. There's some validity in this because the old stereotypes were a bit too stifling and that kind of thing certainly don't want to leave the impression that that in any way shape or form we're endorsing uh any of this because as you just correctly point out you know on the ground in the trenches in dealing with adolescents in particular and quite frequently adolescent girls we're dealing with something that is actually in many many ways quite sinister quite creation denying quite god denying uh, as you say in your article, no reference to transcendence whatsoever. It's all fluidity. All, it's it's fluidity turtles all the way down. And this has tremendously negative consequences. Then you add in the profit motive. Then you add in the ideological moment of, of groups like Planned Parenthood. And, and you get then the potential for gross manipulation of adolescent feelings for all kinds of nefarious reasons. And also, and then I'll turn it back over to you and, and to Rodney. I think it bears mentioning that this whole uh, trans movement isn't just about overcoming uh, sexual binaries. I was just reading an article not too long ago uh, about a guy who has gone through multiple surgeries to make himself more and more like a cat because he identifies as a feline and not as a human being. Uh, and so, and I and I think he's actually serious. I mean, the article is serious. This wasn't some spoof. Um, so I, I, I mean, maybe you could comment on that last point, and then maybe some of the others as well. Yes, yeah. I think the the next frontier is in fact species transspeciesism, because I think you know that's the next thing that seems really solid. Um, yeah, the the I think it's very important to underline what you're saying about the how sinister and dangerous the the gender transition narrative is and then more than the narrative the actual deeds the surgeries and the hormones right. and everything um and and i've argued in other places that we we basically have a spiritual and an identity problem and we think we have a body problem <laughs> and so <laughs> we try yeah. to solve our spiritual and identity problems in other words these deep questions of who am i and is there meaning and am i alone or is there actually a god and and we instead of addressing those questions directly we're like i think i'll take some hormones like obviously i'm being a little flippant here but but we we make our body what i call a totem it's like a, a like a magical instrument yeah. that where yeah. that distracts us and we're like oh but look at that problem and and i think we do this for all kinds of reasons but one of the reasons we do it is it's a lot easier right so it's like it's like so one of the things i've argued about contraception which you know we won't we don't have to go off on that tangent but i've argued that um contraception says that our we have a fertility problem and so we have a technological solution, right? So pills or right. whatever. And so in a similar way, I think gender ideology argues we've got a gender problem. So we have a technical solution. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. in fact, what we have is a spiritual problem. We have an identity problem. And so this is why I strongly disagree with the idea that that hormones and pills are ever treatment for gender dysphoria. I just don't believe it. Um, I know there are some like there are people who are moderate in the gender world, which is pretty radical. and more moderate people in the gender world would be like, well, 
occasionally, maybe very rarely it's treatment. I just refuse to believe it's treatment because gender yeah. dysphoria means that we're not, a person is not accepting his or her body. And so in other words, it's a psychological and spiritual problem. And you just don't solve psychological and spiritual problems by attacking a body. It's just, it's just not the treatment. And so, so I really think it's really important for us to redirect our obsession from the body back to what the real problem is, which is that we don't know who we are. We don't know why we have a body and we take things out therefore on our body instead of taking our problems to God, which is, which is going to be the only solution. Yeah. Fantastic. Rodney. Yeah, no, that's 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 great. I mean, so it, a couple things come to mind. Uh, I love the stuff that you do in the article in the Comunio article about, um, and it seems to me that this is like just one of the most profound parts of the New Testament is this teaching that um, we are we are creatures created in Christ Jesus to do something. And I, there's that beautiful prayer from John Henry Newman where he's like, "You put on earth to do something that sort of only you can do." And and uh, and and then Lewis has this beautiful thing in the problem of pain where he suggests that we each of us fills a niche in the kingdom of God that could not be filled by anybody else sort of thing. Right. So when I start talking about this sort of thing to my students, these like I'm talking 2021, 20, 2022 20, students, it, the, even the most skeptical ones in the classroom sort of like light up for some reason. They're like, oh, my gosh, you mean like I am here on purpose like i came into the world for a reason and like there's something there's some task that i need to do that you know there's something so liberating about that but the paradox of course is that it seems confining right if i like if, if i came into the world as sort of rodney hauser with something in i i was there was some mission in christ jesus that i was predestined to do from all eternity that can be like really constricting Right. They'd be like, well, I have no choices now. I can't be a professional wrestler or, you know, whatever I might want to be, or, which is, you know, big, big chance of that. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, if you think about it, paradoxically, it's the most liberating and beautiful thing ever. Like, you know, it's, it, it's like when Frodo gets summoned from his little, you know, hobbit house and says, hey, we have something for you to do. It's both terrifying and it means the death of old cheese eating Frodo and his little thing or whatever. But it's also like super empower it's it, it like it liberating right at the same time and i think so at the bottom of all of this i think is a really really problematic notion of freedom that we think freedom just means no restraint no limit but that is that's slavery you know i think you kind of mentioned this in the art you allude to this in your article i forget how you put it it's this kind of lovely phrase of we've all been liberated but into a kind of slavery or something like that so yeah I don't remember what I wrote, but I hope it was good. <laughs> you know, don't Apparently you just hate don't that? Either. Don't you just hate that when somebody quotes an article you wrote and you, they know your article better than you do because you, you forgot what you wrote? It's like, oh, I said that. I'm really smart. <laughs> I, Glad I, I said read, that. You read something you wrote and it's like, wow, I knew all that once. <laughs> 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 but, oh but yeah, yeah. No, ab absolutely like the I, I really people <laughs> want to be special and they fear that they are not and that's really so much of the contemporary um angst and um tragedy right that that people feel and they're told right you're just a bunch you know a clump of atoms and molecules and like there's nothing special about you and and then they're told, you know, like, oh, you're absolutely wonderful and everything you choose to do is amazing. And they it's just like all this static and and none of the, neither one of those is really the truth. And really, the truth is that we have been created by God with a mission. And yeah. so you have to get out of that horizontal perspective and get to that vertical perspective to really solve our identity problem. So one of the the things that I'm trying to work on is how like our our obsession with this kind of freedom of fluid liquid freedom with no no boundaries and no nature that holds us back and so forth it's ironically led to this death of the self which used to be kind of all the rage in the 1980s and 90s and philosophy departments that talk about the death of the subject and everything but i think that's because we sort of got to the point where secularity was just sort of petering out and it was like oh wow this this great 
you know, liberated subject is actually like not liberated at all. It's like formed by power as all of these critical theorists say or so forth. And so, um, yeah, like we can't have the freedom that we want outside of the mission and identity that God gives us. And so that's really the the solution to our identity problem is this this like sense of our of our mission. Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple a couple of things here. I mean, God, I could talk about this for hours. Um, I want to I want to go back to uh, something that we were discussing before about the link between biological sex and, and gender. And we were talking about gender stereotypes. Um, it is true, of course, that our body parts, male, female, are ultimately oriented towards our biological role in the generation of life and, and therefore where we're going to fall in the family structure in that regard. Um, and obviously, gender identification as masculine or feminine uh, is also quite often socially constructed. But since you know a lot about, more about this than I, I've often wondered, there must be some general psychological characteristics of what it means to be male and what it means to be female that do cross cultural boundaries and are somewhat related to biological sex. Am, 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 I, am I wrong in that regard? I mean, we don't want to paint it too narrow or too too fluidly, but are there not some broad psychological sort of things that we could identify? Yep, that's that's generally a masculine trait. Oh, that's generally a feminine trait. Yeah, you can. So there's been a lot of good work on this done and about the complementarity of the sexes, which is a term right. that like really raises feminist hackles because they think of Rousseau, where it's like, you know, the 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 guy provides like all of the initiative and, you know, goes out and earns money and the woman like basically manipulates him to keep him happy <laughs> like, so, like that's a lot of when a lot of people hear complementarity that's what they think it is but um but in fact we do know that what we basically have when it comes to these masculine and feminine traits are bell curves so that means that right. you have outliers on on either end and it's not a matter of a hundred percent and nobody's saying it's a hundred percent of all women have this trait but what you do see is this um predominance among women of in orientation towards people toward faces and so my colleague deborah savage who'd be great to have on here actually is knows this stuff like the back of her hand that newborn babies so like no social conditioning they've just come out of the womb newborn girls look at faces longer measurably longer than newborn boys do whereas newborn boys wow. look at objects measurably longer yeah, that's, isn't that amazing? That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. yeah, and so you see, and that kind of, that really summarizes the two bell curves that, you know, on average, girls are more oriented toward people and boys are more oriented toward things. Um, and so like there's other things are clustered around that. So the fact that that women tend to have much more sensitive senses of smell and hearing and they tend to notice distinctions in color. So it's like, you know, the, like, I remember a, a friends, they, they painted their, this couple painted their house and, or they, they were about to paint it. And the woman like did all the different swaths. And the, the guy was like, they're white. She's like, no, like this is e crew, And this is like, he's like, they're white. Right. And they were both right. This is eggshell. Eggshell. <laughs> Exactly. Linen. <laughs> Linen. <laughs> yes, you've been through this. I see you've been through this. Yes. So, I mean, the point it's is we're right. both right. Like, she really yeah. is seeing distinctions of color that are there. And he's not being obtuse. He really probably is not. Like, the women have more rods and cones in their eyes. They can see more distinctions of color. And so, like, why is that relevant? Well, you can see where if you have half of the sex that is ordered towards gestating a child and then nursing that child for like, you know, almost the next year, that having a fine sense of smell and hearing and sight really helps you take care of this little person where you have to be very attentive to like what's going mm -hmm. on and does this food taste actually like it's poisonous? And, you know, so that's really important. Whereas for the men, men are drawn, like boys are reliably find risks exciting and pleasurable 
like as a as a class like they find yeah. risk pleasurable on its own whereas girls can be trained to enjoy risk but they don't normally like start there they usually have to be like socialized into it and so these aren't like a hundred percent these are bell curves but you do see these distinctions and they line up with the the distinctions that that the male versus the female have for the um the roles in in generation and in parenting so when my brothers when i was a kid when my brothers encouraged me to jump out of a third story window into a two foot deep swimming pool below <laughs> and i did so that this was a typically sort of in the middle of the bell curve, masculine trait. It is. It was. And I'm surprised you survived that. Is that a true story? Actually, it was a second story window, come to think of it. Yeah, it is. Uh, true story. And I, I sprained an ankle, but I did not die or break a leg, which or was... Or your back. <laughs> or, or fracture my skull as I slipped on something. Yeah, I was quite fortunate. I only did it once. But I was double dared. And mm -hmm. you have, you, you know, when your brother double dares in front of other guys, you got to do it. And uh, but then when my mother found out, um, yeah, that was not pleasant. Let's just put it that way. And she is. Yeah, she saw some colors. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There were some colors all over. It was all not white. Uh, but anyway, uh, but anyway, th th that's the, yeah. I, I wanted uh, all joking aside. I think this is just a very, very important topic because. There's currently out there, and, and I want to shift gears just a little bit. There, there's currently out there among some some sort of traditionalist Catholics or just very conservative Catholics who I think rightly see the fluidity of gender in our society as in some ways harmful to the raising of young boys and young girls in our cultures. It robs them of a proper form, a proper identity. But in some ways, I think they've erred too far in the opposite direction of thinking, well, we need to go back to Ozzie and Harriet in the 1950s or 40s style of family structure. Um, I'm told that I'm attacking a straw man in that regard, that this does not exist in conservative Catholic circles. Um, but I think that it does. What, what, I mean, have you had an experience with this? And what is your thought on that? I have definitely had experiences with that. Um, I mean, as as far as the bell curve goes, I'm definitely in the more masculine side of things as far as a female. And so I was definitely, you know, tomboy and all of that. Um, didn't even like babysitting, never predicted I would have all these kids that I have, which I love, by the way. So if you're a tomboy, there's doesn't mean you won't love motherhood. Um, but yeah, I've definitely encountered these these more rigid roles. And in fact, there's a book out there called Ask Your Husband, <laughs> which is like purports to be like a gender, a Catholic gender theory. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, is, my God. Yeah. Which is, you know, very much the, you know, the the old the idea that the the female does not have a direct relationship with Christ, that somehow this always has to be mediated through the husband um, is, I mean, one of the things that Christianity did that was so radical was to say, I mean, you see it consistently among all of the church fathers, even when their understandings of gender or marriage might be a little bit, um, you know, more platonic than, than say the theology of the body. Um, but you still find this, this absolute democracy of salvation that, um, and that's what, that's what Galatians means when it says in Christ, there is no male or female. And so, um, when we, when we forget that, like that really has to be predominant in Christian thinking on gender, that there, Christ came to save both sexes and to save them equally. Um, yeah, that, that I think really helps to, relativize these cultural norms that are that are just um they're not going to stand the pressure like if you try to you know escape to nebraska um, where larry's birthplace right and start your own little you know commune where everybody's gonna have strict gender roles like that might work but like what happens if you have a tomboy like you know like yeah, it just yeah. all it just all it risks is is creating unnecessary opportunities for rebellion like we shouldn't you know, we shouldn't be, as Jesus says, we shouldn't be like putting hard burdens on people's backs. And I think that those very strict gender roles are um, are often that, that they are hard burdens. Um, 
where, you know, I mean, I have very artistic boys, right? And the idea that like they should like want above all to run out and cut trees or jump into swimming pools from second floor window, yes. they'd be like, yes. they'd be like, what? Do I don't not count as a boy? It's like, absolutely, you count as a boy. You're just more the Cardinal Ratzinger style of, you know, the Pope <laughs> Benedict style of boy than the Carol Wojtyla well, style you of could boy. Jump out of the window into the pool and then sort of photograph it later artistically or something. <laughs> <laughs> reach a compromise <laughs> reach a, hey okay uh, 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 rodney do you, do you want to add something here because i have a few more questions too yeah no i think that's i think that's super important i've i've over the years larry you and i know because we've taught at the sales we'll get these sort of conservative catholic boys that come in and they're like we're in a men's club and we're gonna go out in the woods and shoot something or you know whatever. shoot things so, like, yeah yeah, yeah, and I was like, well, Ratzinger and Baltazar were taking piano lessons, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you would be lucky to be as manly as them, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, well, yeah, I, I, I just remember, yeah, not to interrupt you, but there was some, and it's a laudable thing, there was this young men's group that was trying to get guys over their pornography addiction. And I don't remember what it was called, but it was a really great group, actually. And they were doing great work. And I don't mean to disparage that, but one of the things that they wanted to do was to teach in order to overcome pornography addiction, they need to learn how to be proper men, which included going off into the woods and killing things with guns. And and I thought, well, I guess that's one way of, of, of doing it. But I it, and, and so I didn't say anything. But what struck me was there's there's a certain sort of gender stereotype that yeah. may or may not be helpful in helping young men overcome pornography addiction. In fact, yeah. it might actually make it worse. I don't know. I, I could be wrong about that. But anyway, Rodney, I, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, that, I mean, so so I think that this is what I think, again, we sort of, to go back to my original point, that we can sort of try to learn a little bit from the, the postmodern types that kind of push on these things a little bit is that these things can be also very cultural. So it could be that in frontier America, one way of demonstrating your masculinity was to learn how to shoot a gun or, or whatever. But there's there's obviously cultures where it's it's not really necessary to learn how to shoot a gun to de demonstrate your you know your your manhood or something like that. And and uh, um, so we we have to be. I, I I do think yeah that's a that's a that's a nice caution that we have to keep in mind. And uh, without in any way shape or form denying, and I think, Angela, you are absolutely right, that there are, as there is a kind of bell curve of things that we can kind of keep in mind that are reflective, again, of the of nature, you know, they're reflective of the body and what the body does. And, and there's, and, and that's where, again, Butler loses me. She's like, already out of the gate, the body is nothing other than social constructs and stuff. And that just, this is, that's just silly. You know? It's not a social construct that women can give birth to children. All right. No. So, oh no, Angela, you want to comment on that? I'm happy to hear another question. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Good. I mean, yeah. Um, shifting gears a bit because you know we we've been going now for about an hour, and I don't mind going longer. But uh, uh, you Not also much longer after past my bedtime. Yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> Same here. Uh, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But so let's get right to it. Then we were talking earlier about Balthazar's notion of, you know, theological person being related to mission. And you said at the beginning, Angela, that you were interested in the, in the sort of the theology of, of the contemporary mission field. This is also very near and dear to my heart. It's one of the reasons why I started the blog was to occupy a certain uh, space uh, that was, I think, being occupied by not so great people. But anyway, uh, how do we translate all of this stuff that we've been talking about with regard to what's wrong with modern concepts of gender fluidity, what's wrong with too narrow stereotypes? How does that then translate in the mission field? Uh, you, you, you mentioned in your article, you, you go on at great length, and I told you beforehand, I think it's just sheer brilliant biblical exegesis that you go through, which in many, many ways is simply to say Jesus was a man in motion, okay? He was, because he was a man on a mission, a heavenly mission from his heavenly father, from beginning to end, from descent to ascent, from birth until resurrection and ascension and beyond. And that then translates into our own concept of personhood as, as missional. So in, the, in maybe the 15 minutes we have left, I, I hope you, that you can elaborate on that concept. 
Sure. Yeah. First, I'll say, because I didn't get a chance to say it, that I think your blog really does do a great service and I have oh, enjoyed thanks. it very much. So yeah, keep it up. <laughs> Thank great. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, happy to say that. Um, yeah. The, the, I, the idea that Jesus is fundamentally a man in motion um, and he is in part because we human beings are all in motion. And so when Jesus takes on a human nature, he takes up what we already are, but sanctifies it and, and elevates it to his divine personhood. Um, but what we see from that motion is, is you're exactly right to say it's, it's about mission, right? That Jesus came to save us. And so he is, as Ratzinger and Baltus are emphasized, the one sent. That just is his, it, that literally is his person um, to get Trinitarian. So for us, what that means is that um, it's it's easy in the midst of all this fluidity to say, we're just going to fly to solidity and, you know, institutions and, you know, solid, solid, solid. And and obviously we need, we need solidity. We need both um, solidity and liquidity. But the, the fluidity that we are made into as in motion coming from God, destined to return to God, that fluidity, um, we right now just disperse into these horizontal, you know, gender and identity and whatever is the new thing that we're protesting or whatever. And that's not going to stop. Like people are like, when is this going to end? I'm like, there's no tell us. So there's no end. Like it's, there's no natural end point. Um, yeah. So we're going to keep doing that. Like if we don't get redirected by grace, but, but what that fluidity is meant is to to propel us on this journey back to God through our mission. And so God didn't create us to be static, right? He didn't create us as he could have, in fact, in the beatific vision. <laughs> we're created at this remove from him. We come from him, but we're at this remove from him. And, and even with Adam and Eve in the garden, they were still, even before the fall, they were still at this remove from the beatific vision. And so it's clearly part of God's providential plan that we have this way of progress. And so that's really what we're, we're like. So we're, we're not just created like a rock or something. We're really launched by God into existence. And so the fluidity that we desire is because we're made for it, but it's made, it's meant to be channeled. And so here's where the solidity comes in. It's, it's meant to be channeled in by our mission to sanctity, to return to God. It's not meant to just, you know, for us to be putzing around with it and you know, all the, the worldly stuff that we're doing, but it's meant to like propel us back to God. And so that's why we like fluidity because God made us that way. But we are also made for the solidity that comes with God's eternity and God's um, mission for us, as Rodney said, before the foundation of the world, like there's there are these anchors in our solidity. God doesn't just like, drop us into this ocean but like he, there's really this the structure that we yearn for also um but so it's 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 in some ways a, a balancing act between not becoming too liquid or not becoming too solid but but most importantly it's that we have that transcendent element that this that we recognize this is a matter of god and god's mission for us and don't just try to find the things that we want and need in the world yeah, and ultimately it's Trinitarian and mirrors that Trinitarian perichoresis where God is an in infinite stillness because he's an in infinite motion. I mean, that's a, that's a sort of very Balthazarian notion. So that in essence, that in us, there's a perichoresis between solidity and liquidity, uh, that, that they're sort of deeply, deeply intertwined with one another. Um, and of course, then that transcendent element has to, has to be there. Uh, and, and this and that this is our identity. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about so much of this language today about about gender, that this is my identity. This is how I identify is how in some ways we're really selling ourselves short because we so identify our being, our essence, who we are with the fact that I'm attracted to this sexually or I think this way about myself gender. It's to it's to treat obviously gender and, and and sex as things that are far more important than perhaps they are. And of course, in one sense, they're very important, but in another sense, they're, they're not as important as that deep spiritual missional vocation that I have from God. And I, I would, I would view that as liberating. If I were a person trapped 
in, in the modern mindset and feeling miserable and depressed and horrible about myself because I bought this whole bill of goods about what my identity is supposed to be. And I lived it out and only to find it grossly unfulfilling, as we now know that many detrans, you know, detransitioning uh, transgendered folks are deeply unhappy. I would think that this vision that you've just articulated would 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 be found to be a deeply liberating one. Yeah. Oh, man, there's so much there that you said, but I'm glad you mentioned the Trinity. So I'm always a little bit shy to talk about the Trinity because I would like talk about the Trinity all the time and people often can't like don't understand what I'm talking about. But um, but yeah, I mean, you see this balance between solidity and fluidity in Aquinas's language of the persons of the Trinity as subsisting relations. Mm -hmm. And so that's a a purity, a simplicity that we are not capable of because we're not God, and so right, goes. right. But but it does show the um, the the model, right? That we so God subsists, so the solidity. He remains. He's reliable. He doesn't change. He doesn't have bad moods. Um, but also, he's in relation, right? And so it's like it's like the the arrows of relation between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. That's who the persons are. And so the fact that we have this that we partake in Christ's mission means that we partake in some way in that Trinitarian reality. And so again, it's not just, um, it's not just a, a modern hang up with fluidity, but it's because there's this echo in this distant divine way of who God really is in fluidity. And so that's what I, you know, when I said at the very beginning, I wanted to try to find the good thing that people desire. The good thing that people really desire is the Trinity. Um, they just have no idea. <laughs> Even most Catholics right, have no idea, but, but <laughs> no, that really, really is. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also commend the methodology theologically that, that you've adopted here. In other words, I really don't think, for example, that the old neo-scholastic ca anthropology categories, which were very objectivist, essentialist, uh, I, and I don't think that's a caricature. I think that's that's relatively true, ahistorical, not taking into account very astutely uh, human subjectivity and so on. I, I just don't see how, and plus neo-scholasticism tended to have a very dialectical rather than an analogical understanding of, of the relationship between theology and, and the other human uh, sciences and so forth, sort of sort of oppositional. So I, 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 don't, I just don't think that if the church were still merely armed with a neo-scholastic arsenal that she would be equipped to deal with the crisis at hand. Whereas you have adopted a theological methodology that says, non-dialectical, analogical, that says we're going to look at what insights modernity has on this topic. As you began by saying, we're going to look at what is positive here. And then we're going to show how the Christian message, the Christian theological anthropology actually trumps that. We can show you a better fluidity. We can show you a better sense of identity. And that's what I really loved about about the methodology uh, of your article, is that it, I think it, it's it's sort of modern resource theology, resource mod theology at its best. I, I really can't recommend it enough. But anyway, um, hey Rodney, do you uh, have before we uh, end this? Do you do you have more that you would like to add? More questions? Any comments? No, no. I mean, maybe a final comment, and I don't want to be the last person to talk, but I just have this thought that um. You know, as we were talking about this, I, I was thinking about this thing in 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 Paul, where, where you know where he's talking about sort of you know you, you know wh where our identity is, and he, and he says, "Put your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, for you have died, right, and your life is hidden, right. God right. in Christ." This is a guy who's like hyperactive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Paul's yeah. not a contemplative monk in a monastery. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's important. But he is a guy who's out. He's like out in the streets. I mean, he's out. He's constantly on the move. And and so why would he say that? Like, why, you know, why, why would he say? But that, that's precisely what it seems to me at its best a mission does is it is it first find out who we are in Christ Jesus. And then it and then it takes that out into the world. Right. So we so we have to have both subsistence in to, to quote now big dave schindler and then and then an ecstasis out we can't just have one or the other and i i fear where we are in modernity right now is this is all it's hyper 
out. It's all out, out, out. But then you're just drained. There's not there's a there's a kind of insecurity, anxiety. Everybody's having anxiety now and depression because they don't know who they are. They're just they're trying to invent themselves from whole cloth. Whereas it seems to me that if you're sort of already rooted in something, now I can go out and do really interesting things, which are totally unpredictable. Every individual is going to have a different one. So there is that diversity and all that stuff exciting, but it can't just be that or it's 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 anxiety inducing and depressing. Absolutely. I think the exitus ready to scheme. Uh, you mentioned that in your article. Adrian Walker talks yep. about this a lot. Adrian, yeah. I think, is is the most brilliant human being I've ever met in my life. <laughs> That's a different topic for a different day. Uh, so, Adrian, I, I doubt Adrian listens to things like this, so I'm safe in praising him publicly. He's at home reading something in the original languages. <laughs> Probably. I don't care or what with some is. underworld spy or the wife of a close friend or something like that. My beard is exitus radius. It grows out, and then I shave it off because my wife hates it, and then I grow it back. So I've, I've got a whole platonic beard scheme going on. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know why that popped into my head or Adrian or whatever, but you brought it up. You brought it up. So, uh, Angela, do you have any last words for the viewers before we uh, sort of wrap this up? Oh, wow. Profound last words. Um, not really, <laughs> but, um, but I, yeah, just I think, too, when when we're focused on the fact that there's a good that people want, even if they're failing to find it very often, but that, that, that there is a good there. I think that that provides some perspective and some hope when we look at our world, which otherwise is just, you know, seems very hopeless. Um, I think that, that keeping that in mind, that, 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 that I think can help us to, to both feel more at peace, but also to be better evangelizers, honestly. And that, I think, is the best last word we could leave with is because I think evangelization is the name of the game these days, or re-evangelization in some cases. I would like to thank Dr. Hauser, Dr. Frank, for, for being here. This was fantastic. I think it's such, and I, I have to thank Rodney for, for the suggestion. He said, you need to get Angela on here. We need to talk about gender. I said, oh, yes, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> And so it would be great if we could do this again, because there is just so much more to talk about. But anyway, thank you both so very much. And uh, we will now, uh, we'll, let's see, it says stop recording here. I'm going to punch that. <laughs>